Hello friends, you're watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is Ryan Day, and as always, we want to thank you for joining us this week, every week, as we have been studying the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. The three cosmic messages is the title of our quarterly, written by Pastor Mark Finley. And guys, what do you think? Has it been a blessing? Ooh, oh, yes. a Tremendous blessing. This has just been phenomenal. I love the three angels' messages. This is God's end time message, and we're excited to have been able to study it. And well, we're not through yet. We're on lesson number 12, which is entitled The seal of God and the mark of the beast part two. Got to have two parts when you're talking about these two subjects because they're heavy hitters. But nonetheless, let us go ahead and introduce our Sabbath school panel at this time. To my left is Ms. Shelley Quinn. It's a joy to be here. My lesson on Monday is the falling away. Mm. Good. To your left is Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Ryan. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is Satan's final strategy. Wonderful. And then to your left is Pastor John Lomacane. And mine is simply the mark of the beast. <laughs> All right, simply. the mark. Wow. <laughs> and then, of course, last but not least, Miss Jill Morricone. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. I have Thursday, the Sabbath test. All right. Yes, this is definitely going to be one of those that you're not going to want to miss. In fact, we encourage you to share this material with as many people as possible. Download the 3ABN Plus app. You can send the, the, you know, all the links that you need to everyone. You can also download the material right onto your computer or phone. And so it's exciting to be able to share God's Word in these last days. Before we get started though, I would like to go ahead and have a prayer and then we're going to dive right into the lesson. So Pastor James, would you pray for us? Yes, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for this opportunity to study, to learn, to grow. We want to thank you for everyone that's tuning in. We want to ask that your Holy Spirit will guide our hearts and their hearts to Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. 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 Our memory text for this week comes from Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. And the Bible says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I, I always like to just remind people that the mark of the beast is not something new in the sense that it's a new idea because the devil doesn't have any original ideas. He steals all of his ideas from God. Uh, God had his seal first, his mark first, his mark of authority, his sign of authority first. And of course the devil comes along and says, ah, God's got his mark. God's got his seal. Well, I'm going to have my mark. And notice we'll see as God's mark is also in the forehead. Well, the devil says, I'm, I, mine's going to be in the forehead and in the hand as well. So again, this is a counterfeit that the devil is doing. But before we set up for what the seal of God, this mark of the beast issue really is all about, we need to dive deep into Sabbath afternoon's lesson first, and it's going to set us up for Sunday's lesson entitled The Deadly Wound. But I like what uh, Pastor Mark Finley had to write in Sabbath afternoon's lesson. He said, in the 15th century, the Piedmont Valleys, high in the Alps of northern Italy, were home to the Waldenses, a people determined to stay faithful to their understanding of the Bible. As the result of their steadfast loyalty to Christ, they were fiercely persecuted. In AD 1488, the Waldenses in the valley of Lois, I'm guessing that's how you say it, were brutally murdered by the Roman church for their faith. Mm. Another wave of persecution came in the 17th century when the Duke of Savoy sent an army of 8,000 into their territory and demanded that the local populace quarter his troops in their homes. They did as he requested, but this was a strategy to give the soldiers easy access to their victims. Mm -hmm. On April 24, 1655, at 4 a.m., a signal was given for the massacre to begin. This time, the death toll was more than 4,000. Mm -hmm. History, unfortunately, is often repeated. Mm -hmm. The Mark of the Beast prophecy is about the final link in an ungodly chain of religious persecution that goes back through the ages. Like the persecutions of the past, it is designed to force everyone to conform to a certain set of beliefs and an approved system of worship. And of course, as always, though, God will have a people 
who will not capitulate. Amen to that. God's people are going to stand strong on his word. And we're going to be going into Sunday's lesson, which is going to set us up for this end time fulfillment of this, uh, all that we're talking about. And we have to talk about the deadly wound because again, there's a deadly wound that's given. And we know that in the future, that deadly wound is going to be healed. It's been healing. It's not quite there yet, but we're going to see that my friends in the near future. Uh, as we have already studied, the beast powers of Revelation 13 and 14 represent a worldwide system of false worship. Uh, but when, right now what we're going to look at is that period of time in which this system, this antichrist Roman papal church state power dominates for 1260 years. Now where do we get this from? There's a few places in scripture where this is mentioned multiple times in a few different ways. And we see it in Revelation chapter 13 verse 5. Again that's Revelation 13 verse 5 where it says, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Mm -hmm. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And you know that this is talking about prophetic timing because no one speaks like that, right? <laughs> uh, you know, you don't, when somebody asks someone, you know, how old are you? You don't say, oh, that person's uh, 54 months or that person's uh, <laughs> 72 months or 42 months. No, no, no. This is speaking of a prophetic time period. And we know that in the Bible, a period of 42 months in a year, there was, uh, there was 12 months in a year, obviously, but there were 30 days in each month. And so if you do your multiplication correctly, 42 times 30 brings you to 1,260 days. But we know as we're going to talk in just a moment, the year day principle applies. Also, Revelation chapter 12, it's mentioned here twice in the same chapter and in two different time frames, but speaking of the same exact time period. And it says here, then the woman fled into the wilderness. This is Revelation 12, verse 6, and then we're going to skip to verse 14. So Revelation 12, 6 says, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Okay, so that's the same as the 42 months we just read in Revelation 13. Again, 1,260 days coming out to 1,260 years. The woman flees into the wilderness. This is the pure woman of Revelation 12. This is the pure side of God's people. And of course, they're fleeing the persecution of that harlot woman of Revelation chapter 17. But then in verse 14, it says, but the woman was given two wings of an eagle, of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for, notice, a time and times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. And we see also that same, that same time period mentioned, or that, the way it's mentioned, the time, times, and half a time from Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, where it's talking about that little horn power, that, that papal antichrist system in the form of the little horn here. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute, persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to to change times and laws, but then it says, and the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half a time. Of course, time meaning one, a period of one year times two years. And then of course the dividing or the half of that time is a half a year. That's three and a half years. If you cal calculate that uh, in the days, of course, there's 360 days in a year that would come out to 1,260 days. But we know we have to apply that year day principle. Now, where do we get this from? We get it from a few places in scripture. There's actually a few places in scripture where this, uh, this principle is applied in which someone is speaking of a prophetic time period or in prophetic terms, and they convert days to years. We see this in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34. God is speaking to the children of Israel and he tells them, look, for every day that you have wandered in this wilderness so far, you're now going to wander that many days converted to years. We see it in Numbers 14, 34, in which it says, according to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt. How many? One year, mm -hmm. namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. So I'll make that correction. It was 40 days that they spied out the land, not mm -hmm. 40 days in the wilderness. I want to make that correction there. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6 also applies the same year day principle, which, which the scripture says, and when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. But notice he says, I've laid on you a day for each year. So they weren't supposed to be there 40 literal days, but rather 40 years. And even Jesus, did you know Jesus applied the year day principle? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, some of Herod's men came and they confronted Jesus uh, about Herod's plans and Herod was wanting to know all about Jesus and what he was doing and they were just making it hard for Christ and Christ responded speaking of Herod notice what he said to Herod's men he said he said go tell that fox behold I cast out demons and perform cures today 
tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. Now, this was not in the last three days of Jesus' ministry. This was actually toward the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he said this. He was applying the today, the tomorrow, and of course the third day as you know the three years that was remaining in his ministry. So my friends, what we see is pertaining to prophetic time period when we are dealing with sequential time prophecies. In other words, more than you know, multiple years or multiple days, we convert those days to years in most cases. And so in this case, we have to understand the backstory of how this deadly wound is set up because we're not talking about 1,260 literal days, but 1,260 years that this Roman church state power would rule supreme. But of course, we know that time period to be from 538 mm -hmm. AD to 1798 AD. It was in 538 that Justinian, of course, gave uh, that power over to the Pope to be both a political and ecclesiastical leader throughout all of Western Europe. But the, you know, the, the ground had to be kind of, the foundation had to be set up even prior to that. And I'd just like to give a little bit of a backstory because I find it to be ironic that it was the French who actually helped bring the papacy to power in the beginning, and it was the French that took them down. Mm -hmm. If you back up a little, just a few years before 538 AD, you come to 508 AD, and it was by that time that one of the most significant and influential, well, most powerful kings throughout Western Europe, Clovis, the king of the Franks, which of course became known as the French, he converted to the Catholic faith, and of course this was, this was an important event that paved the way for the union between church and state, which held sway throughout the Middle Ages. And of course, the, Clovis helped basically give authority and help set up the dominant influence of the papacy between 508 and 538 AD. Now during that time period between 508 and 538 before the papacy was given official authority by the emperor, you know, obviously there were 10 major nations uh, that were obviously the divisions of Rome at that time. You had the Alemanni who became known as the Germans, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Franks became known as the French, the Lombards, the Italians, the Saxons, the English, the Suevi, or the Suevi, the uh, Portuguese, the Visigoths, the Spanish. And then you have these three that were completely wiped out, the Heruli, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths. And it's interesting that uh, it was in AD 493 that the Heruli were wiped out with the help of Emperor Zeno. Uh, and in you see this in Daniel 8 where it says that an army was given over to the little horn. Mm -hmm. He had to use the political uh, powers to get what he wanted. So he teamed up with the emperors and with the uh, kings and the queens of the nations. The vandals, of course, were taken down in 534 AD. Notice how we're making our way again to 538 AD in which the Ostrogoths were wiped out. Mm -hmm. Now, my friends, it was in that year, and you can go read this in A.C. Flick's The Rise of the Medieval Church, page 168, where he confirms uh, this historian, A.C. Flick, he confirms that, yes, the, uh, the, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome was given that, that authority, the political and church authority over all of Western Europe. And now if you count now from 538, something's got to happen in 1798. Mm -hmm. And we know that it was definitely in 1798 in which the French, Napoleon Bonaparte, he says, I'm not sharing my authority with the Pope. He sent his man Berthier into Rome. They took the Pope. The, the Pope captive, and uh, he spent uh, he spent basically in many many years in prison, in which he would eventually die. And it was there at that time that the church was stripped of their political authority. They were just a church. They were given a deadly wound in which they weren't able to carry out all of their deeds. That is the deadly wound that is mentioned of. It is still healing now, but it's not quite healed. But it will be healed, as the Bible says, mm -hmm. soon. I so enjoy being on this panel with all of you Bible students and we all learn so much. I'm Shelley Quinn and Monday's lesson is the falling away, the apostasia, the turning away from God's word, God's truth, turning away from God. We're going to look at 2 Thessalonians 2 and see what Paul predicts about the last days and what are the identifying marks for the beast, the Antichrist power. Second Thessalonians verse 2, let's look at 3 and 4. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. He's, he's trying to assure the Thessalonians that no, those are false reports to think that Jesus has returned. Mm -hmm. He says that day will not come unless the falling away, in the Greek, that's the apostasia, comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, 
who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Mm -hmm. Now look down to verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. The coming of the lawless one, lawless one being the one who does not keep the commandments of God, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why do they perish? He said, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved. Mm -hmm. We here try to give you a love for the truth because mm -hmm. it is imperative to your salvation. So the lawless one here in 2 Thessalonians 2, the beast power you're referring to in Revelation 13 and 14, and the little horn power that is described in Daniel 7 share many similarities of identifying characteristics. So it reveals that Paul in Thessalonians, John in right. Revelation, and Daniel in the book of Daniel are speaking of the same power. Right. This power, history proves, is papal Rome. This is what the reformers believed as well. But here's the root of it. Satan, the great deceiver, wants to be exalted. He wants to sit in the temple of God, and he is working through human agencies to accomplish his purpose. I want to read a note from the Adult Bible Study Guide. Mark Finley put this very well. It is extremely important to remember that Bible prophecy is describing a system of religion that has compromised God's Word, substituted human traditions for the gospel, and won this system that has drifted away from biblical truth. These prophecies, he goes on to say, are given by a God of incredible love. Mm -hmm. Prophecy is never meant to scare us. Prophe prophecy is to lead us to truth. Mm. So he said, these prophecies are given by a God of incredible love to prepare a people for the coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. They are a rebuke of apostate religious organizations that have departed from God's word, though not necessarily to the people in these organizations. You will remember Revelation 18, God's making this mm -hmm. final appeal of mercy and he's crying, come out of her, my people. So our message is about a system that has deceived millions and though deceived, these people are much loved by Christ. Here is his summary point. Hence, these people who are in the apostate systems who are so loved by Christ, hence, we must treat them accordingly. Mm -hmm. Apostasy is turning back from God, to turn away from the authority of His Word, to fall away from the truth. In Mark 7, 13, Jesus told the people of His day, the religious leaders, you're making the Word of God of no effect through your tradition. What well, we've seen, and the Catholic Church clearly admits, that Sabbath was changed, the sanctity, from the seventh day Sabbath of, that God blessed, that God sanctified. They clearly claim we changed it to Sunday. So that is a tradition of man. And Jesus would say today, that is nullifying the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You know what? Here's something that's interesting. The devil doesn't care if you fall away on the right ditch or on the left ditch. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? The counterfeit gospel, anytime it doesn't line up with God, if you fall away on the right ditch, you become legalistic. Listen to Galatians 5.4. You have become 
estranged from Christ, who you who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Boy, if you've got any legalistic tendencies, if you think in any way you can save yourself or that you can contribute, listen to these words. You have fallen from grace. God's covenant of salvation by grace is righteousness by faith through Christ Jesus, and He expects total dependence upon Him. Trying to save yourself through works is legalism. And I'm going to just tell you, legalism is the earmark of all false forms of religion. Right. Obedience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. obedience is not legalism. Right. That's right. Obedience Amen. is love. Mm -hmm. And love is the highest expression of worship Good. to God. Love is the pathway to God's cut. Obedience is the pathway to God's covenant blessings. Yes. So you can fall off on the right ditch through a counterfeit gospel, or you can fall off on the left ditch through a counterfeit gospel. And when that happens, listen to this. Jude, verse 4. Certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness mm. and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Someone in a church told me that someone came and gave them a message of grace and the elder of their church came out and said, Hallelujah. I can come out of the closet about my pornography now. Mm -hmm. I'm saved by grace. Let me tell you something. Somebody gave an unbalanced message on grace if that was his impression because Christ did not suffer and die for us so that we can live like the devil. Mm -hmm. God's goal of the everlasting covenant is to make us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He's going to justify us and sanctify us. He's going, he paid the penalty for our sin, but he will definitely separate us from sin. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy chapter four. We're going to begin with verse 1, 2 Timothy 4, 1. Paul's writing, this is his, he's, he's second imprisonment in Rome. He's about to die. This is his final where, farewell to his beloved Timothy. And he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing, and his kingdom. Preach the word. Amen. Be ready in season and yes. out of season. Mm -hmm. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering mm -hmm. and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. Mm -hmm. They want to hear a message that pleases them, that lets mm -hmm. them off the hook mm -hmm. for any accountability before mm -hmm. God. They will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Mm -hmm. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians 11, or 2, verse 11. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, yeah. that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12, whatever you want men to do, do also to them. Mm -hmm. If you love somebody, you have got to go out and tell them the truth. Mm. Mm, amen. Amen. Thank you, Shelly, so much. My friends, we're just now getting this engine going. We're not mm. quite through just yet. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity.
Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to be passing it to Pastor James Rafferty at this time for Tuesday's lesson. Tuesday's lesson, Satan's final strategy. Now, I really appreciated, Ryan, what you shared about the history. You know, uh, someone has said that those who are not familiar with history are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ecclesiastes 1.9 says there's nothing new under the sun. What has been will be. And that's exactly what the quarterly brings out for our lesson this week. I also appreciated what you shared, Shelley. You know, God has given us Bible prophecy not to scare us, but to prepare us, to get us ready, to know what's coming around the corner so that it doesn't take us by surprise, right. so we can be ready for it. Uh, Tuesday's lesson, Satan's final strategy, the quarterly says this, surveys reveal a deep lack of trust in institutions and governments. Millions wonder where is there someone who is morally fit to lead the world? Revelation's prophecies identify the papacy. Now we uh, identify this power as the beast in Revelation, but that's a symbolic word. It's identified in Daniel 7, 17 and 23 as an earthly power or kingdom or king. We've identified this earthly power or king as the papacy. Ryan did a great job giving us that history and leading us down through time. Shelley also went to 2 Thessalonians and we're going to look at this in more detail because 2 Thessalonians uses a specific word when it identifies this apostasy and this power that would rise up and put itself in the place of God, the vicar of the son of God, it claims to be, it uses the phrase, the son of perdition. And that phrase is unique to two characters in the Bible, to the papal system and the person who leads that system, and also to Judas, who was the one who portrayed Jesus. He was identified by Jesus as the son of perdition. Now, here's something really interesting. Jesus is identifying Judas in John chapter 13 and verse 19. I'd like us to look there in John chapter 13, verse 19, because this really helps us to solidify the reason why God has given us Bible prophecy in the context of the mark of the beast. None, God doesn't want any of us to be surprised about the mark of the beast. So this is what Jesus says in John chapter 13 and verse 19. Now, I tell you before it come, that's Bible prophecy right there. I'm telling you something ahead of time before it comes to pass that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he. Mm -hmm. Now I am telling you before it comes to pass, Bible prophecy, that when it comes to pass, you might believe that I am he. Now this, in this context, Jesus is specifically talking about Judas and the betrayal of Judas. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the son of perdition. Right. You see, we have a son of perdition in the end of time and Jesus had a son of perdition in his time. There's nothing new under the sun. And the son of perdition in Christ's day was a disciple. The son of perdition in Christ's day was one who was close to Christ, one who followed, one who was given power and authority and had a religious uh, 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 appearance. The son of perdition in Christ's day was one of his own. The son of perdition at the end of time there's nothing new under the sun, is a professed religious power, one who claims to be close with Christ. Christ exposed him to the disciples in John 13, 19. Why? Because he wanted us to realize that Jesus knew what was coming. He revealed prophecy to us so that we would have faith, not in the fulfillment of the prophecy. Right. You can know prophecies, but without love, ha, they That's prophecy true. you nothing. Right. Not the prophecy only, but that that prophecy would build faith in Jesus, mm -hmm. that we would actually, through understanding Bible prophecy, recognize that, whoo, Jesus is the author of prophecy. This is amazing. He's, he's got this all figured out. He knows what's going on. Now, again, we're not talking here about individuals. We're talking about institutions. Mm -hmm. God is identifying institutions. Yeah. There are a lot of individuals in those institutions, whether they're religious institutions or federal government institutions or health institutions. There are a lot of individuals in those institutions that are God's people. Mm -hmm. And God has called us to enlighten those who are still in this confusion. How? Well, it's not really our job. It's God working through us through his word to bring the word out, to share with the world this beautiful three angels' messages. Mm -hmm. Amen. The lesson quarterly goes on to talk about how the world then is going to be looking for some kind of leader, right? Revelation's prophecy identify the papacy as the one who under the auspices of a religious political union will be the power believed to fulfill this role, someone that they can trust in, someone that they can look to. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 17, beginning with verse 12. Let's look there in Revelation 17, beginning with verse 12. 
Verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind. They shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And I really appreciated what you shared in an earlier program, Shelley, where we talked about we're not just called, we're not just chosen, we're also to be faithful. So what we see here is an amazing picture, really, of the entire world, the kings of the world, everyone coming together with this beast that is destined to perdition, verse 8 and 11 of the same chapter, destined to perdition, this beast, this earthly power in a religious guise, just like Judas was, that unites the entire world, or we should say the entire world unites around him, and yet the Lamb, which is symbolic of Christ, of Calvary, of the cross, 28 times singular in the book of Revelation, 29 times with a plural, focusing on Jesus Christ and his great sacrifice for us because that's the center of the three angels' messages. Christ on the cross is the everlasting gospel, united against him. And we know the reasons why. I, I, I know that we're, we're still going to cover some of those reasons why it is that there's a conflict between Jesus, who is the essence of true religion, and this, this counterfeit religion that the whole world unites around. But the quarterly goes on to share, and I really appreciate this. Let's just read here what it says. It says, there are three significant points John makes in this passage. First, the political powers that have one mind and give their power and authority to the papacy, and I'm adding that phrase in there, that, that um, interpretation in there. Um, excuse me. The first, the political powers have one mind and give their power and authority to the papacy. Number two, this conglomerate of error makes war against Jesus and the Lamb. Number three, in earth's last war, Christ and his followers are triumphant and the papacy does not win. Jesus does. Mm, that's right. yeah. So, have you ever wondered? The quarterly goes on to say, have you ever wondered what strategy the devil might use to unite the nations? History often repeats itself. We discover valuable lessons from the, the collapse of the Roman Empire. When the dramatic tribes in, or dramatic invasions took place from the north and ravaged Western Europe, the Roman Emperor Constantine turned to religion. Mm -hmm. The authority of the church combined with the power of the state became the very instrument Constantine needed. Mm -hmm. The continual strengthening of the sanctity of Sunday in the fourth century was a, was a calculated political and religious move to unite the empire at a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. Constantine wanted his empire united and the Roman church wanted it converted. Mm -hmm. The renowned historian Arthur Weigel says, uh, states clearly the church made Sunday a sacred Day, largely because it was the weekly festival for the sun. It was a definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals and dear to the people by tradition and give them Christian significance. Paganism in Christianity, New York, 1928, page 145. So at the time of a great crisis, when all the world is scared, hurting, fearful, people will be desperate for someone to bring some stability and protection. Are you listening, friends? Mm. Because this is where we are right now in our world. We are in this... Uh, crisis, we are desperate for someone to bring stability, for someone to bring protection. We're hurting, we're fearful, right? This is how tyranny has arisen in the past. Mm -hmm. History will be repeated. Those who don't remember that are doomed to repeat it, and there's no reason not to think that it could not happen again. Right. According to the prophecy, something will bring about these final events. That's where we're headed right now. And if you don't think it's possible, as we formulate uh, an understanding from Bible prophecy of what the mark of the beast actually is. You want to think about an experience that I had when I went to a Muslim country, the country of Pakistan years ago. It was an Islamic state. That, was, that meant it was illegal for a Muslim to become a Christian. If a Muslim became a Christian in Pakistan, they lost, they were, they were to be killed by parents, by relatives, by whoever was close to them, by whoever. In this country, I remember waking up on Friday and thinking, this is the day of worship. Everyone's going to be going to the mosque. Everyone's going to be praying. But it was business as usual. There were cars driving. There were businesses open. Everything was, I was amazed by this. And people told me, oh, yeah, only the very devout go to the mosque on Friday. It's only the very devout that, that observe this as the day of worship, the day of prayer. And so then I woke up on Sunday. When I woke up on Sunday morning in the city of Karachi, I opened up my blinds and guess what I saw? Absolutely nothing. No cars, no businesses, no people. I felt like I was in a Western country back in the early 20th century, right? With all the Sunday closing laws. And I asked someone about it. I said, what's going on here? I, 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 how come there's no business open? I, oh, 
this is a new development. We have decided to start closing the business on Sunday and being open on Friday because of the economic pressure of the rest of the world mm -hmm. who is open for business on Friday and closed on Sunday. We were falling behind economically. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the mark of the beast, when we think about this Sunday worship, when we think about uniting the world together, we need to think about some of this history and some of the developments that are taking place right now in order to understand what the Bible is teaching. Thank you so much, James. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Ryan, for laying the foundation on a topic that's a humbling topic. I want to speak briefly to those of you that are watching this program and listening. Uh, you may not even be a Christian at all. You might be saying to yourself, well, I just found 3ABN. Let me see what they have to talk about. And you may have stumbled in or been, been led by God on a day where we're dealing with probably one of the most difficult topics in the closing drama of Earth's history, the mark of the beast, this great system that is being put in place to cause us to either receive eternal life or to be destroyed eternally. Mm -hmm. So I want to just encourage you not to take this one program and decide, wow, that, that, that network is just too hard on me. I don't even know Christ. And then you may be a part of a denomination that worships on Sunday. We mentioned Sunday references quite a bit, how it's not supported by scripture. But what I want you to understand is when we get to the third message of the three angels, Revelation 14, verse 9, there's a warning there. The warning is being declared by God. Why is God declaring the warning? Because he knows that the decision you're about to make will put you in opposition to him or in favor with him. And many of you are worshiping God according to the things that you know and are not aware that right now this whole system of Babylon, we talked about Babylon, the system of worship that's leading people to acknowledge one day above another with excuses that are not scripturally supported. But now we get down to the thing that all of humanity wants to know, what is it? What is the mark of the beast? What is his image? What is this number? What is his name? What is this about being in our foreheads or in our hands? So let's go ahead and start by looking at a couple of things because we know Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10. Let me read that very carefully for you. Revelation 14, uh, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, Then a third angel followed them, saying, With a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, a scourge that anybody would want to avoid. Mm. And so now the number has come up quite a few times. We read in Revelation chapter 13 where the number he clearly defines as uh, it's the number of a man. Verse 18, here is wisdom, Revelation 13. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. But some of you may not know, or maybe a large majority may not know that that number 666 appears in another place in scripture. And so let's go to 1 Kings chapter 10, and let's see this in 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 14. And this is brought out in the lives of one of the men that we highly admire, the man Solomon. Now Solomon, praise the Lord, he woke up one day and said, 700 wives and 300 concubines, this is not God's plan. Let me get back to the way God wants it to be. But in his rise to fame, in his rise to popularity, in his rise to political and, and materialistic strength, there was a transition in Solomon's life. Mm -hmm. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. The weight of the gold, speaking about Solomon's great wealth, that came to Solomon yearly, this came every year, was 666 talents of gold. Mm. Now notice this came yearly. This was a cadence that continued. So Solomon was yearly recognized 666, 666 over and over and over and over again, building up his wealth and his material possessions. But you'll find that why is this so significant to mention in scripture? Because this goes against the very injunctions put out in Deuteronomy 17, verse 16 and 17 to 20, that the leaders of God were not to be identified and create an allegiance to materialistic wealth. Their allegiance was to be in serving God and leading his people. And so we find in the very same cadence today, many religious leaders are succumbed to the, to the seduction of wealth. And that's their focal point. They're, the God is their belly. But what has happened as a result of their decisions that they make, 
then they are put into one category, a category of allegiance to God or allegiance to the beast and his power, his mark, his name, and his image. That's why we go to Revelation chapter 13 now and we read some very significant words. I'll read Revelation chapter 13 and um, where it talks about he causes, verse, verse 16, all right? He says, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then the calculation comes in to make it very, very clear that the number is 666. Now, why six? When you look at the creation week, man was created on the sixth day. That's, right. That's the day of man. And when you read this in the Greek, not only is this not only does it say it's a number of a man, but it also says it's the number of humanity. And then Romans 3, verse 23, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here's my point in putting it together. If you stop at six, you fall short of God's completed creation. Mm -hmm. If you stop at six, you focus on man and not God. And so the beast system is to get you to focus on man, not God. That's why he's found ways of trying to substitute. Let's not look at that seven. That's why in the Roman Catholic Church today, they say, hey, God created light on the first day and Jesus rose on the first day, the day of light and the day of resurrection. Mm -hmm. So let's ignore the seventh. A man is saying this, mm -hmm. the sixth. Let's ignore what God blessed on the seventh. Focus on the first day, the first day. So that's why today in, in the Christian world, most people honor the first day of the week. It's not an injunction of scripture. It's not a word of the Bible that gives you that authority. It's a word of man, six that system of six. So Satan has put into place a system that says, don't let your mind be governed by God's word. Let your mind be governed by man's word. You see friends, the decision to receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God is what happens in our minds. Let's go to Romans chapter 12 and verse two. Jill, would you read that for us? Romans 12 and verse two. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You notice friends, the mind is the battleground. Mm -hmm. The word of God is stored in our minds. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus says that sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. But where's that truth stored? Look at Philippians chapter two and verse five. Who has Philippians two verse five? Shelley, read that for us. Philippians two five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So Satan wants to affect your mind. The way you think determines your worship. The way that you believe determines your worship. But where do you believe? You believe here, but you act it out with your hands. That's why the mark is in the forehead or in the hands. The condition of the mind activates the motion of the hand, the motion of the life. I'm going to worship this way. So by my feet, I go to church on Sunday because my mind believes that that's what I should do. But when you follow God's word and the mind of Christ is there, your feet move differently. I'm going to move in the cadence of God. I accept the Sabbath. That's the difference. But now a lot of us think that this decision is decided by Rome. Rome cannot make a decision as to what I should do. I make a decision. Right. All of the power of the Antichrist system doesn't force me to do anything. That's right. But Joshua made a very powerful statement in the writings of Joshua 24, 15. He says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Notice there, the choice is made. Where is the choice made? In our minds. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes down, we find this cadence in scripture throughout. When Israel in their mind and worship rejected God, the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 7, I will cut off Israel. Israel's refusal to acknowledge God in their minds and in their lives led to God cutting them off. We find the whole nation of Israel the Lord says, I come three years looking for fruit. I found none, cut it down. But then the gardener says, wait, one year also. And so for the last three and a half years of the ministry of Christ, after he ascended, he said to the disciples, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Notice the lost sheep, they're lost right now. I don't want to cut them off. They got three and a half more years. At the end of the three and a half years, what happened? They got cut off. Behold, you allow, your house is left to you desolate was the words of Christ in his day. Then you also find later on, and this cadence is continued. So in the very end, we're going to find the very same cadence, but how is it going to be decided? God is in control of the final. We make the decision, which God does not manipulate. Mm. And then God decides based on our decision, he puts into play the process of, okay, if this is what they want, I will send them strong delusion that they will believe a lie. Mm. But they make the decision in their mind to reject the truth first mm. and the strong delusion. God says, is, if this is what you want, 
this is what you're going to get. If you don't want manna, I'm going to send you quail. God always decides based on our decision what to do next. And so we find Revelation 17, verse 13. You have that for us, James, very yeah, Revelation quickly. Revelation 17, verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. That's right. And then Revelation 17, 17. Hit me with that one. For also. God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So here's the pinnacle issue. The Sabbath versus Sunday is a choice you make in your mind. You either follow what God established in Genesis, the last day of the week. He blessed that. He said, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Man says, forget and honor Sunday. The pinnacle issue is going to be Sabbath worship. You make that decision in your mind. And so when the mark of the beast is imposed, when men receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God, it's because of the choice that they make. Today, friends, let this mind of Christ be your mind and you will not receive the mark of the beast, but you will receive the seal of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John and each one of you. What an incredible study. What insights Praise into the, the word of God and into the mark of the beast. I'm Jill Morricone. On Thursday, we look at the Sabbath test mm -hmm. and we're looking specifically at the seal of God. Mm -hmm. So what is the seal of God? A seal is used to guarantee security or indicate ownership. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His. That's ownership. That's we belong to God. Biblical seals have three components. Shelley talked about this on a previous lesson. The name of the sealer, the person giving the seal, their title and their territory. Mm -hmm. In the heart of the Ten Commandments, in the fourth commandment, God placed his seal. Mm -hmm. You find that in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. What is his name? The Lord your God. What is his title? Creator. What is his territory? The heavens and the earth, mm -hmm. the sea and all that is in them. The seal of God is found in the fourth commandment. We cannot receive the seal of God without keeping God's seventh day Sabbath holy. But I want to expand it a little more than that because oftentimes we say, well, the seal of God is Sabbath versus Sunday, mark of the beast seal of God. And it is most definitely. But the Sabbath is also a sign that God sanctifies us. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, I give them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me, that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. The seal is not just observance of the right day. It is an indication of the sanctification process that has happened in the life of the believer. The difference then is between this outward observance of the Sabbath and inward sanctification. You know, we have people today who could say, well, I worship on Sabbath, but their lives aren't transformed. They're not being changed into the image of Jesus. Those who receive the seal of God in their foreheads will keep the commandments of God, including the fourth commandment, will have the faith of Jesus, will be covered with the white robe of Christ's righteousness, will experience the sanctifying process of the God of the Sabbath. Here's a quote. I have it in my phone. That's why I'm holding my phone up. This is from Ellen White's writings. This is 7 Bible Commentary, page 980. It is a sanctification of the spirit that signalizes the difference between those who have the seal of God and those who keep a spurious rest day. It is the sanctification of the spirit. Let's do a quick comparison, and then we have seven takeaways at the end, but let's do a quick comparison between Ezekiel chapters 8 and 9 and what we find with the sealed ones in the book of Revelation. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 8, we see an investigative judgment going on with the people of Judah. Now, a little history. We know that Ezekiel is prophesying during a time of judgment on the kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem. In fact, twice already, Nebuchadnezzar has come and decimated the people of Jerusalem. And yet, the people are still engaging in the very practices that called forth God's judgment in the first place. They're not changing. The Spirit takes Ezekiel and vision 700 miles across the Arabian desert to Jerusalem's temple courtyard. 
God is investigating his people. He brings, uh, they call it a reeb, a covenant lawsuit. He is bringing a legal case against his people. And at the end of the investigation, he declares that their probation is over and judgment descends. In Ezekiel chapter eight, you see this four series of scenes. Each one is more abominable than the last one. They all involve faults in counterfeit worship. We see the false idol worship that provokes God to jealousy. We see animal worship, which is part of this spiritualistic cult mixing practices from Egypt. We see the woman weeping for Tammuz the counterfeit of the coming Messiah. Mm -hmm. We see the 25 men worshiping the sun in the very place where they were supposed to come and seek forgiveness from the Lord. In Revelation, false worship is again this issue in the final conflict. We see the false day of worship being elevated, which is Sunday. Now in Ezekiel, we see the probation is closed on the house of Judah. The professed people of God are separated into two groups. Mm -hmm. Those who receive the mark on their forehead, we'll talk about that in just one moment. And those who embrace this counterfeit worship and those people are killed. We see that God leaves the most holy place and announces this executive phase of the judgment. Now in this time in Ezekiel, there was chance for restoration and repentance because after the 70 years of Babylonian captivity, God called his people back. But in Revelation, there is no second chance when we're at the very end of time and there's the issue between the seal of God and the mark of the beast, there's not a second chance. There's not 70 years or so many years and we can have a second chance. You know, the investigative judgment is just not a time of cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. It's a time of cleansing of God's people on this earth, making us ready for the soon return of Jesus. In Ezekiel 9, we see this mark placed on their forehead. Ezekiel 9, verse 4, the Lord said to them, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who what? sigh and cry over the abominations done within it. This mark in Hebrew, Tav, is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It was shaped like a cross in Ezekiel's day. And it's a symbol of the last ones, the remaining ones, the remnant. But those who received this mark, they sighed and cried over the sins of the people. I wanna read you another quote from Ellen White. This one is from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 211. The class who do not feel grieved over their own spiritual declension mm -hmm. or mourn for the sins of others will be left without the seal of God. Mm -hmm. wow. In Revelation, we see at the end of the sixth seal, remember just before the second coming of Christ, they're crying for the mountains and rocks to fall on them. And they're saying, who shall be able to stand? In Revelation 7, we see that those who are sealed by God on their foreheads are able to stand. In Revelation 14, we find that these same people are without fault before the throne of God, that they have the name of God, the character of God written in their foreheads. So here's my seven takeaways very quickly from the ceiling. Takeaway number one, the seventh day Sabbath is a test for God's end time people. Those who keep the seventh day Sabbath at the end will be sealed. Number two, the seal is a sign of sanctification. Number three, the seal is given to the last ones or the remaining ones. It's given to the remnant. Number four, the seal is placed on the foreheads of those who represent Christ in character. Number five, the seal is given to those who confess their own sins or the sins of others. Those who sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the land. Number six, the seal is a mark of protection against the judgments that will be falling on the wicked. Just like the blood on the doorposts at the time of Exodus was applied to the doorposts to protect them when the destroying angel passed by. Finally, number seven, the seal is a sign that you and I are filled with the Holy Spirit. I think of Ephesians 1 verse 13, that we are sealed 
with the Holy Spirit of promise. Mm -hmm. So to me, this topic is life and death. This topic is life changing. Will we receive the mark of the beast? Or will we make a choice to receive the seal of God? And it's not just Sabbath versus Sunday. It is most certainly Sabbath versus Sunday. But there is more encompassed than simply, oh yeah, I go to church on Sabbath. I'm good. I don't have anything else to worry about. Where is your character? Where is your heart? Who has your allegiance? Where does your mind go? Where do your thoughts go? Who has that? And when you sigh and cry for the abominations done, when you love Jesus more than anything, when you seek to honor him and let him work out his character in your life and in your heart, worship on his holy day, you will receive the seal of God in the last days. Mm. Wow, powerful guys. Thank you so much. It's been such a blessing to be able to just revisit this powerful truth. And we certainly need it for our time. Let's go ahead and get some final thoughts from the panel. A quick final thought. There will be people in heaven who will be celebrating their first Sabbath there. The issue that we're talking about is the end of times. There are people who are ignorant, but remember what 2 Thessalonians, what Paul said, that we need to have a love of the truth if we don't want to perish. Study your word. Amen. God is giving us these prophecies, not to scare us, but to prepare us. God wants us to be ready for what's coming. He wants to show us what's around the corner so that we can keep our eyes in Jesus and he can safely take us through the mark of the beast and land us in, into the new heaven and the new earth. Friends, the issue is simple, your allegiance. Mm -hmm. Whom will you serve? You decide to serve God through his word, his written word, or you decide to follow man in his word. That's going to be the deciding issue, whether you receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast your choice of allegiance. Amen. We've referenced it many times, Joshua 24, 15. Just make a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Amen. Thank you guys so much for such a powerful lesson. It's a great reminder that we need to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Exactly what he was praying there in, in the Garden of Gethsemane before going to the cross. Jesus said in John 17 and verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Do you know Jesus? That's really what it comes down to. Either you know him or you don't know him at the end of time. My friends, you're not going to want to miss next week because we're going to be taking on the final lesson of this quarter, which is lesson number 13 entitled Ablaze with God's Glory. It's going to be exciting and you're not going to want to miss it. We'll see you back right here next week.